Well, good morning. We're proud of our students. We, a lot of times we'll go on mission trips and we forget to tell you about them. So we just wanted you to see some of the pictures of the great things that are taking place. Um, I, I want to welcome you. Thank you so much for being here today, for fighting the traffic to making your way into the building. Uh, my name is Scott Verno, and I'm the lead pastor here at Community Life. And it is just an honor to have you here in our family room today. At Community Life, we love God. We love our neighbor. And our mission, our mission is to connect people to Jesus, because we believe that Jesus is the source of life. We're not perfect in doing that, but everything that we do is going to be geared in that direction. And so if you find yourself lacking a connection, we'd love to talk to you, um, because we believe that Jesus is that source of life. Uh, A couple quick announcements before we, we jump into the message today. So those who came in the front, and you were able to see the golf cart that Courtney's talking about, there are two things you need to know. Number one, Everybody that sees it that is from Tuscaloosa immediately says, roll tide. Okay, so it's red, and so we're going to institute a charge. Every time you say roll, no, I'm kidding. Um, (laughs) You cannot miss that golf cart, and Courtney has it parked up on two things. That is not indicative of the way that we will pick you up. (laughs) Maybe, Um, because we have a rule that only 16-year-olds are allowed to drive the golf cart, so that's... No? Uh, y'all are like, no way, man. There's no way. Um, we, we are instituting this golf cart into the parking lot, and we're going to figure out how all of that's going to work. We figured that if we had a bright red one that you'd be more likely to not run into it, so let's see how that goes. Um, we are starting that next week, and we're going to put a diagram up on the, on the screen here um, for you to see kind of how we would love for you to consider flowing through the parking lot. Now, some of you, you have different music inside your head. And you just go with whatever happens in front of you. For the rest of you that can kind of gather this in, this is how we'd like you to consider. Um, To turn in, in the very first turn in the parking lot as you enter, and come in and just flow around that way. If you go left, then you're going to have to come back and loop back around. But hopefully you'll either go into the triangle or take a right and make your way around to the first available spot. Parking will be there to help you kind of get in and get everything situated. Um, And when you leave, we're going to ask everybody to go around the loop road and come out that second entrance And if you are from Navarre, we would love for you to consider to kindly follow all of the traffic laws and maybe go down Soundside and just view a very beautiful scenic route. But maybe that'll (laughs) clear out some of the congestion trying to get across 98. But maybe consider that way. The rest of you will figure out how to get you out on a 98 quickly. But that's that's what the goal is. Who knows what next week's gonna look like. It's gonna be absolutely insane. So maybe, maybe consider doing that. Um, we have, if you were here at the very beginning, um, you got to see the video for Fifth Thursday. That's coming up. Excited about that. If you have any questions, ladies, about the Fifth Thursday ministry, stop by and, and see the ladies out at the um, table outside. Uh, there are scholarships available for those who, um, maybe that $10 is, is, not, is not good for you this time and season. We'll make sure that we make that happen. And then also Kat, who is our director of discipleship, she's gearing up for this fall season, and she has everything sorted out, man. She is a rock star uh, when it comes to life groups and, and Bible studies and all of that. And so she's putting the big ask out there, and she would love for 20 to 25 people to consider being leaders. Now, for some of y'all, you're like, well, I'm out. Um, I promise, knowing Kat the way that I know her, she will train you, prepare you, and she'll put a team around you that will ensure that you're successful in starting these life groups. What we need for, for people to have opportunities to engage and plug in and get to know one another, it's difficult in a big church to make those, those community gatherings, to, to be able to make those points of connection. So if that's something that just piques your interest, stop by and see her or stop out at the welcome desk, and, and we'll go ahead and get you set up for that. And then last but not least, next week is the launch Come early, come often. It's going to be incredible. Got some new things we're going to tell you about. We're going to even practice and try to learn how to use the lights before then. Scott's doing awesome in the back, but the board doesn't do sometimes what it's supposed to do when you mash buttons. So um, everything's going to be great next week in Jesus' name. Amen. (laughs) See, if you say in Jesus' name at the end of something, it's it's all good. Uh, Okay, so today we start a new series, and the name of the series is Yes. Now, I can't just say one word, so I have to say two because I'm a preacher. So I'm calling the series Say Yes. And over the next three weeks, we would like for you to consider saying yes to three things. And I'm just going to go ahead and put them out, <clears throat> excuse me, put them out there up front so that you kind of know the direction of where we're going. So the first thing that we're going to wrestle with today and we want you to consider saying yes to is raising your expectations of what God can do in your life and in this community. And we're going to talk about that today. The second thing next week, we're going to ask you to consider saying yes to connecting to Jesus and what that might mean. 
And then on week three, we're going to ask you to consider to say yes to connecting others to Jesus and discovering that greater story and our responsibility and role to play and, and how that unfolds. And so just to kind of set up the series and, and what we're going to talk about today and saying yes to raising our expectations, can we all agree that tomorrow begins a new season? Can we all agree that? Like, regardless of whether you have children or ever wanted them or even know who they are, your life will be different tomorrow if you spend any time on Highway 98. That's just the way that that's going to be. We know the season's about to change. We prepare ourselves for it, and we adjust accordingly, right? So for those who are going through Gulf Rees, you're going to leave early. Um, I'm not exactly familiar with, with what traffic does in Navarre, but I, I've been through those schools. Micah went to the intermediate and primary schools. It's just insane. So we know what's going to happen. We adjust for it. Some of you parents will um, send your children off to school for the very first time, and you are really nervous about that right now. Like, your eyes are watering up, and tomorrow morning you're going to cry, and you're going to take pictures, you're going to post them all over line, and, and it'll be through tears of, of sadness that you'll send them out. And then there are some parents. <laughs> there will be tears of joy as you put them on the, on the side of the curb an hour early, right, so that you get ready for the bus. <laughs> Because you have adjusted to the new schedule and you have plans. Like you're going to do something. Maybe go to the beach, go shopping, maybe do nothing for the first time in, in, in three months. That's what your plans are to do. But you know what the season is. We're adjusting for it. Our expectations are there and we set course for it. So I want to ask a question. I could belabor that point and just go on for hours. But let me ask a question. What if I told you that God has a new season in store for you? an exciting season, a season where you discover this beautiful, incredible story that's unfolding around you, and you possibly find your purpose and your design, and you, and you realize that there's a role to play in this world that goes beyond maybe punching a clock or doing the things that maybe you consider that yourself, your, your days are made up of. And maybe, what if I told you that there is a season that awaits you starting tomorrow and the only requirement is to have a willing heart and to literally just say yes, to make yourself aware and to make yourself open to what it is that God wants to do over the next few months in your life and maybe in the life of our community. For some of you, you need to say yes because you just have this thing inside of your heart where you want to be a part of something bigger. And so I encourage you to say yes and see the journey that God can take you on. For some of you, God knows what's in the next three to six months. And, and so for you, preparing your heart and preparing your life will to be preparing you for, for the opportunities or the challenges maybe that you're going to face. And so saying yes might prepare you for that. But, but, but I wonder if we consider that in allowing our expectations uh, to be uh, to, to, to raise to the point to where we prepare ourselves for what God is doing in our lives and in our communities. And I just want to challenge you on that today as we look at some scripture that's pretty well known to all of you about Jesus calling the first disciples. But we're going to get into it in a little bit different way than maybe you've not read it before um, to kind of see how this unfolds, that there's a bigger story that's unfolding as we read through this narrative. So if you're, if you're following along in your Bibles, um, turn to Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to pick up in verse 12, but I'll just go ahead and tell you to set this up. Matthew is writing his gospel to a Jewish audience. So the things that he writes are going to be tailored to their understanding of Scripture, of the greater story. And so this part of Scripture is going to be very important to him how he unfolds this. But you also need to know that in the context of chapter 4, we just talked about this in the wilderness series where Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist, goes into the wilderness, and verse 12 is him coming out of that wilderness, or this is the first thing that, that Matthew documents after that particular period of time. So let's just read it, and then we'll come back and teach the scripture and, and see what God says about um, the expectations of our heart. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. It's now when, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. And we're talking about John the Baptist. So when Jesus heard this, he withdrew or he moved to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea. In the territory of, and I'm going to, I wrote these words down phonetically. Let's see how we do. Zebulon and Nephtali, so that when, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulon, land of Nephtali, 
on the road to, by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And that's going to be an interesting phrase that we're going to look at in a little bit. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. Isn't it interesting that some of these verses are coming back as we thought about the wilderness, as Jesus is just coming out, then Matthew's using these words, the, the shadow of death, talking about Psalm 23, and then how he pulls all that together. Verse 17, from that time, Jesus began to, rep- to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Verse 18, and this is the, the say yes part of the scripture. And as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And they said, and he said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And we're going to come back and talk about that because there's more to the story. I mean, it almost seems odd that they're fishing and someone walks up to them and says, hey, follow me. Okay. Right? Like that, that doesn't fit logically in our minds. There has to be more to the story, right? So we're going to come back and we're going to talk about it. So immediately they left their nets and they, they followed him. Verse 21. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, and this is where Matthew wraps up the chapter and launches us into the next part of Scripture. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and far beyond the Jordan, the places where people would go, pilgrimage to go visit, those places are now coming to see Jesus. And then if you were to read on in chapter 5, Um, Matthew then moves into talking about the Sermon on the Mount. And so Matthew is positioning Jesus, the beginning of his ministry, and then he's going to give you the message. And so what we really have is the setup of the birth or the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And so let's let's dive into this today as we we consider um, this text and we look at some of the things that are in there. I'm just going to go through and teach verses 12 through 25 and then come back. And there are just two quick thoughts I think that will challenge us as we think about raising our expectations for what God can do um, in this season that's in front of us. So let's just dive right on in. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Uh, it's, so, it's so interesting to me to know that Herod goes and he arrests John the Baptist. Now, when I read this getting ready for, for today in, in all of the different settings, it seems weird to me that John had been arrested so early on in Jesus' ministry. So weird that I had to go back and study it. And do you know that in Mark and Matthew and Luke, this same note is in there where John is arrested. That Herod was tired of John speaking speaking out about him and and, um, his sin in his life. And so Herod thought he was going to deal with that and just had John arrested. And there's a beautiful story that, it's not beautiful, it's a horrific story, um, that you can read about John being arrested. But I often wonder if Herod thought that he was getting rid of the voice of John forever by throwing him in prison. You you ever imagine if he would have known that Jesus was going to fill that void? And so it didn't really work out the way that he probably thought it was going to. So, all right. So so when he finds out that that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. Um, That word withdrew seems odd to us. Uh, It just means that he moved his ministry or he went to that place almost as if to fill the void that was left by John's voice. Verse 13. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of, of Zebulon and Nephtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. So let's talk about this for a moment. Remember that Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. And for him, he starts to paint this interesting narrative, and he uses these two territories, if you will, to connect the reader, who is ourselves, or to him, the people at the time that would have been reading, to this greater story. And so he takes Jesus in context, and he puts him inside of these two territories, and when the Jewish reader would have read those two names, it would have connected them to, to, to Moses and to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they would have started to see a larger picture unfold. And so these two territories were spoken of by by Moses as he was proclaiming the lands that God was going to ultimately give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that these would be territories that ultimately would be taken over. 
And so if you're reading this and, and, and that's your faith and you've, you've studied your scripture and you've studied Isaiah, these words leap off to the page to you as he connects Jesus to this larger story. And so he goes on and, and he tells you that he's, he's quoting Isaiah, that it might be fulfilled. And, and then he says, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles, the Galilee of the Gentiles. I wrestled with that all week. I looked at, tried to find as much as I could that would give me insight about this. And, and you find out something interesting in reading that helps you to determine maybe what that means. So in this area, there is, um, even though this area was conquered by the Jewish nation, they never really followed through on their task of pushing out all of the other foreign beliefs. And so in these two territories, the other beliefs of other gods and the other things that would detract away from God's people and get them sidetracked stayed inside of these communities all the way from through the time of the exile all the way into now Rome is a part of this part of the world. And so when he calls it the, the Galilee of the Gentiles, he's making reference to the fact that this particular area is filled with Gentiles. That even though in the larger scheme of things, this was land that was claimed by God's kingdom, it's really the Galilee of the Gentiles, that there's still this mashup of what's going on. And, and Mark, excuse me, Matthew starts to paint the picture of this kingdom this, that's been formed in this area or their understanding of time and place, even so much so that he goes on in verse 16, he says, the people who sat in darkness, so those who were in the midst of this belief system that, that really was never cleaned up, all of these different things. Now they've seen a great light, like a new season is coming upon them. And for those who sat in the region of the shadow of death, where, where there wasn't really that full, complete takeover and God's presence was, was fully there, a new light is dawned. Like they're starting to see something break with Jesus, that in that kingdom, in that world, there's a new understanding that's coming and a new light has dawned. And he gives it to you in verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, and it's the same message that John the Baptist was proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, we've sometimes read this in some of the other chapters, it would say the kingdom of God. I want you to know that Matthew was Jewish, and they were always nervous about saying kingdom of God because you don't want to blaspheme, so sometimes, and use God's name inappropriately, so I, I believe that's probably why Matthew said the, the kingdom of heaven. But this phrase on the end, he says, the kingdom of heaven has come near. In some of your translations, it says, is at hand. Jesus is proclaiming a different kingdom alongside of what it is that they're looking at. He says, here comes this new kingdom, but to say it's at hand falls short of the understanding of the translation. This new kingdom is at hand doesn't mean that it's, it's there, or this new kingdom that's come near as it's close by. This new kingdom is here to join or for you to become a part of, to disconnect yourself from one and to connect to the other. And so what Matthew is doing is he's painting a picture of two kingdoms that are in contrast with one another. The kingdom of this world that is a mashup of everything else, and then this kingdom that represents something altogether different. And so quickly moving along in verses 18 through 22, this is the, the say yes moment, if you will, where we have the disciples that, that seemingly, if you just read Matthew, just make a decision to follow this rabbi with nothing else in mind. If you go back and you read in Luke, Luke gives you a little bit more insight. And we know that they didn't just make a blind decision, but rather there were some things that we struggle with the chronology of these, but there were some things that happened that informed them in making this decision. So we know that Jesus, when he went into Capernaum, goes into the synagogue and he starts to teach. And there's a person there that's demon-possessed and Jesus cast the demon out of this person and, and everybody is amazed at what's taking place. And then a short time after this, he's invited to go to the house of Peter's mother-in-law, maybe for lunch. We don't know what it is, but when he shows up, she has a fever and she's sick. And Jesus goes in and heals her. And then you can follow on inside of the story of, of when Jesus finds himself beside the Sea of Galilee and the disciples are there and there's two boats on the shore and he gets in one boat and they push him off the shore and he starts to teach. And then he takes the disciples and he says, let's go out and put the net on the other side of the boat and they catch all this fish. And so when they make this decision, you have to know that it wasn't a blind decision. That for these, for these disciples, the faith of their childhood that they studied, that they learned, that they go to the synagogue to learn about, now is laid right before them. That they see this person who could possibly be the Messiah. I mean, like this could be the one. And so when they choose to walk away from everything they own 
It's not just a blind decision. It's because they discover a new kingdom, a new way to live, a new um, promise to plug their life into. And that's why they choose to do exactly what they do. There's the expectation of what it is that Jesus is about, this journey that Jesus is about to take them on. And so they, they make that decision. That one of the words I love in there is the word make in verse 19. I will make you fish for people. This means to burst forth with new growth. That, that Jesus is, is going to prepare them and hone them and get them ready for what it is. So it wasn't just a, a blind decision that there was the promise of, pre- of preparation for this journey that was going to be ahead of them. And then 23 all the way through 25, as in, in my men's group, and Bill Brinkley kind of brought this up, and I think he's exactly right. 23 through 25 is the movie trailer of Jesus' life, right? Like if you were to have a cool voice, and, and I don't have this voice, but if you were to, to read this and you would say, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted in the various diseases, right? And he healed them all. I mean, just went on and proclaiming the word of the kingdom. That's exactly what you get. Oh, stop it. <laughs> really? If I had my glasses on, I'd know who you were. I was patronizing me. I love it. Um, but that's the movie trailer, right? And, and he, he puts it in there for a particular reason. It's, it's to let you know that they had an expectation. They had an expectation that if you were sick, they were going to drag you to Jesus. That that's the life, that's what they believed about this moment and this particular time in history. And so the readers that were reading it, that were discovering this for the first time, would have said, really? Like all of this was unfolding. It makes sense that this movement was so huge and so many people chose to believe because of what they were seeing unfold right in front of them. And so that, you, you get to see all of that inside of that scripture. So, so let's, let's dive in and let's talk about what does it mean to say yes when you consider this scripture to, to raising our expectations of what God can do in your life and maybe in the, in the life of our community. And I want to draw some contrasts that I'm going to tell you aren't going to be perfect, but you guys know my heart enough to know where I'm going in all of this and just, just hold on and trust and, and see if you can't hear maybe what I'm saying in all of this. Um, I think we can all agree that, that we live in a, in a, in a nation that's, that's pretty divided. It's pretty divided on so many fronts that when, when the tragedies of these last few weeks hit the news, everybody immediately draws sides and everybody immediately starts to vilify the others. And it's a hot mess. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, this is not a political message. You'll never get that from me. But politics bring us to this place where we have to talk about this. Right, like, like we get to that place to where everybody draws sides and everybody kind of makes up their determination. And, and if I was to go through this room, there are a few people in this room that I know, if I took you and you and I placed you in a room together, you would literally fist fight. Like that's the way that you feel about certain things. That it's possible that two people can believe something so vehemently opposite that, that and two people that believe in God, that trust in God can still fight over it because they can't understand how the other person can think that way. And I think what has happened, I think what has happened is that in the Galilee of the Gentiles, we have become comfortable with the darkness and with the shadow of death. And what I mean by that is that I fear that in all of this, we have allowed the greatest thing to become just another thing. That we've allowed the greatest thing, the most important thing, the proclamation, the kingdom to become just another part of of what it is that we think life is all about. And here we read inside of this message that Matthew is painting a very clear picture of two kingdoms of two kingdoms, one kingdom where things were blended together and they never were separated out. And it's a kingdom that is, that finds people sick and broken and hurting. And then there's this other kingdom that comes that, that brings the light, that, that a new day is dawning inside of it. And it brings me back to what we've talked about over the last few weeks of, of thinking about God sometimes, not necessarily as the source, but thinking about God as a butler, uh, that's odd to say that, but we navigate through life and we do everything that we can. And then when we run into something we can't do, we call God and, and ask him to come in and try and figure this out. I think we honestly view God as a piece of the puzzle, that we're looking at the puzzle that's in front of us and we're trying to figure out where to fit God in all of it. When honestly, the greater story that's unfitting, God, God fits in all of it. God's given us instruction and design and a way to live and we're, we're seeking his kingdom. Jesus didn't come to this world to fix a political process. He didn't come to this world to to solve particular. He came to save this world and to offer us 
God's kingdom a totally different way to think and to process and something for our hearts to connect to. Now, please don't hear me say that I that I'm not patriotic and I'm not, I am absolutely all of those things. I love this country and this country has done more to further the gospel than maybe any other country, all of the beautiful things that have been able to be accomplished. But if you have the United States elevated right alongside the kingdom of God, then you have a misunderstanding somewhere in your life that the United States is a nation that is broken. As beautiful as the constitution is, it's broken. It's been written by human hands. Yes, this country has been blessed in so many tremendous ways, but we adhere to and we hold to a greater kingdom, a kingdom that brings hope and brings peace. And so here's, here's my thought on all this. Two, I got three minutes. Two thoughts, and I can do it all in three minutes-ish. The first one is this. I wonder why Jesus started off in the, the region of the Galilee. If you were one of the most learned rabbis that that understood scripture, you were the son of God, where would you naturally usually start your ministry in this this region? In Jerusalem. The first place you would typically think to go is Jerusalem because that's that's the center of the religious world for the Jewish nation. Jesus doesn't do that. He starts his ministry near the Sea of Galilee with people who have faith, but also people who... Um, are living life, who are trying to figure out how to make it. That's not to say that they weren't in Jerusalem, but in Jerusalem, the religious world had taken politics and they had taken uh, policy and they had taken religion and they had mashed it all together and they were struggling to separate it all out. And, And ultimately, as Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem, what do they do to him? They kill him. So you go back and you look at Jesus starting in the Sea of Galilee. This message started to resonate with the people who were wanting to expect more, people who were looking for a Messiah, people who so desperately wanted to connect. And so when you think about this message, you think about raising your expectations, don't think that you have to be the most learned or the, the, the person that's, that grew up in church. That's as far from the truth as possible. Jesus ran into simple fishermen in an area of the world that was full up of people that were Gentiles that knew nothing about God, and it was from that region that this ministry exploded. And so hold on to that inside of your heart uh, and to the things that you believe. And then secondly, um, I'm blown away by their expectations. When you read this story, 23 through 25, for those disciples to make the decision that they made, they had to have seen something or been a part of something that would cause them to walk away from security in a time and a place in the world where that might be the only thing that you have. And I want you to know they had religion. They were, religion was accessible to them. But this to them wasn't religion. This was something altogether different. That when they watched Jesus and they listened to him, their hearts burned inside of them. They knew this was something different. So much so that they walked away from family businesses They walked away from family to start on this journey that they maybe had no idea where it would take them. But that's where their expectation was. So much so that when you get into this story, that if you knew someone that was sick, you were going to drag them over to see Jesus. It isn't too long into the story where so many people are in Capernaum, jammed around this little bitty house that they couldn't get the sick people in. And so what do they do? You guys know the story. They start to rip the roof off of Peter's mother-in-law's house. If you were the son-in-law, that would be a problem. But, you know, go with it. So that's what starts to happen. People had an expectation that if you meet this Jesus, something will change in your life. And so I ask you the question today. What if we chose to believe that way? What if we chose to believe in a different kingdom? What if when we pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done, what if we meant it? What if we understood it? What if we believe that Jesus still heals? What if we believe that he was the great physician? What, what, do we believe, what if we believe that, that he is the creator? And as we're struggling in our areas of business to come up with new ideas, what if we trusted and believed that he is the creator and can give us an idea that no one else has thought about? What if we believe that our children, who sometimes can be crazy as they're struggling, that that God cares more about them than we could ever possibly, and he goes with them to school and he'll lead them through college and he'll walk them through all the challenges of life? What if we dare to believe that way for the things that we challenge in life or that we're facing in life? Because I'm going to tell you, it just takes saying yes and, and, and removing our hearts from maybe a process that's broken that churches are afraid to believe in and trusting in the God of creation, the God that came to save this 
world, to save you, to save those who you most care about. The only thing I'm asking you to do is consider raising your expectations just a little bit because God will work with that. I'm telling you that this may be some of the most vital months, years of your life that are in front of you. And as surely as you somehow ended up in this church on this day, you have this preacher telling you to prepare your life, to get ready for these wonderful things that God has in store for you. Raise your expectations and trust and believe that God can do something profound in your life and also God can do something profound in this community. Uh, last week here on this stage within Circle Ministry was one of the most amazing Sundays for me in my life. Being able to stand alongside and, 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 and minister with people that, um, that have special challenges in their life, but they're putting it all out there. If that doesn't raise your expectation, we got to pray. Come find me afterwards and we'll pray. We've all given, been given design and we've all given, been given purpose, but we've got to be willing to raise that expectation and connect to this greater kingdom and believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And it all starts with connecting our hearts to him and believing in Jesus. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message, God, and for what you're doing in our hearts and our lives and in our community. And, and as I see, the, it's literally the beauty and the chaos with all of the people and all of the full chairs. And I know what the parking lot's going to be like in a little bit. God, these are the days seeing the great growth that we're experiencing in our church and in our community. These are the days that we'll tell our children about and our children will tell their children about because we're seeing you in a palpable way. But God, that means that you've called us to engage. We want to be a part of the great things, not just because of ourselves, God, but because there are lives that hang in the balance. We lean into you today, God. We learn to trust you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we play this song, I want to open up the front to you. I invite you to come down if you'd like to and spend some time in prayer. I'll be on the side. If there's something that I can specifically pray with you about, well, I'd be so honored to do that this morning. In the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful when I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring
See, God spoke about raising expectations, but let me ask you a question. Let's go back a little bit further. I think one of the great weaknesses of the church in general today is that we don't have raised expectations. We have no expectations. And I think too many churches in this world, whether they're filled or not filled, are filled by people who come, leave, and nothing changes. There are no expectations. I think that's a real tragedy because from Genesis to Revelation, we are promised so much by God in our relationship, in our love, in what he would have for us. I think the great danger is that we have, as the church general, have listened to a lie for centuries upon centuries. And that lie is something that we hear in our minds where it says, yeah, the promises of Jesus are real. And he can do all those things, but he'll just do them for other people. He won't do them for you. And we buy that. And as a result, we have no expectations. So as we leave here today, one of the things I would pray is the fact is we question ourselves. Do we expect God to work in our lives? Do we expect him to make a change in our life? Does he, do we expect him to take care of us, to fulfill the promises he's, he's given us. That scripture is full of promises. Do we believe them? Expect change. Put your trust in him. He will deliver. Don't listen to the other voice that says, he'll do it for other people, but boy, you're a lost cause. He won't do it for you. That's a lie straight from the enemy. Would you stand with me? Lord, we thank you for this day and for the gift of your Holy Spirit who has been our teacher and our guide today. And Lord, when we read Scripture and we ponder it and we meditate on it, we see over and over again the love you have for us. Flawed, broken, wounded, sinful, fallen, it makes no difference. Your love never changes. And Lord, you never leave us in that situation. And you say, come to me, all you who are laboring, all you have got a great burden on your shoulder, and I am going to give you rest. Do we believe that? Is there expectation that when I do that, he will restore me? He will energize me? He will make me an agent for change. He will make me a person who shares the gospel and gives the light of Christ to his family and to his friends, to his co-workers, and to this world. Lord, we expect change in our lives when we come to you. And it was meant for us. And we thank you. And we praise you in the precious name of your son, Jesus the Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week.